Okay, so tonight is the April full moon night. It's called Bakpoya in Singhala and it's called Chitta Punamasa in Pali. On this day in Sri Lanka, what they commemorate is the Buddha's second visit to Sri Lanka. If you remember, I told you the legends of Sri Lanka uh, before, I think in January. Uh, but I'm just going to summarize this second visit uh, for you tonight. In the fifth year after the awakening, uh, the Buddha, through his supernatural knowledge, knew that a war was breaking out in Sri Lanka between two groups of Nagas. So when the Buddha had visited the first time, if you remember, he had chased out from Sri Lanka all the Yakas. So the Yakas had been chased to another island, a mythical island, if you will, uh, and they were living there. But the Nagas were still living in Sri Lanka. And one of the main centers for the Nagas was called Nagadipa. Still today, Nagadipa is a very famous pilgrimage center in Sri Lanka. It's off the west, northwest coast of Sri Lanka. It's one small island, about four kilometers by one kilometer. And the events I'm going to tell you about now took place there. So there were two Naga groups. One was led by Mahodara and the other was led by his nephew Chulodara. So these two had followings, large followings of Nagas and they had fallen into a dispute about the ownership of a jeweled throne. So they were going to war about who really owned this jeweled throne. So the Buddha was at the time in Sarvati in northern India, but with his supernatural knowledge, you know, in the morning and in the evening, the Buddha would always look around the world to see where he could be of use to people. Okay, so he looked around and he saw that a war was about to break out. So he decided to travel down to Sri Lanka to settle this war and to bring peace uh, to Sri Lanka. So if you remember when I told you before, one of the devas in Sarvati actually living in the tree, he picked up the tree and he took it down with him uh, to give the Buddha like an umbrella. It acted as an umbrella, so the Deva was holding the tree over the Buddha as an umbrella. That Deva's name is Samiddhi. Uh, sometimes you will see representations of this with a Deva holding a tree over Lord Buddha to keep him from the elements. Uh, so that's portraying this event, you see, when you see it. So when the Buddha got there, what he did is through his supernatural powers, he spread darkness all over the island and all over uh, Sri Lanka. So the Nagas were very frightened because of this uh, great show of power. And then after he had subdued them, if you like, brought them to kind of a, a position where they were willing to listen, then he spread metta. And you know, if you've ever been with somebody who really has a lot of metta, you can really feel it. You can really feel it. It really uh, emanates from them. But you imagine what it's like if the Buddha is doing metta meditation, you see. It must be really, really powerful. Yeah. So the Buddha spread metta 
uh, to the Nagas that further calmed them down and then he gave them a Dhamma teaching about anger and the, you know, the, the problems of anger uh, and how anger just starts over a little thing yeah starts on a little thing and then it grows and you feed it and it grows and you feed it and it grows and before you know you've got a whole war going on so that is what had happened actually in Sri Lanka between these Nagas so the Nagas said okay we'll just destroy the throne we'll just destroy it like that but uh, they had a second idea a better idea which was that they would give the throne to the Buddha so they gave the throne to the Buddha and the Buddha sat down on the throne and uh, then the Nagas came and served him dana. You can sometimes see representations of this, you see. It's very nice when you see it. Right? So one thing is, you know, about the Brahma Viharas. The Buddha was always emanating these good qualities of metta, karuna, mudita, upeksha, and so on like this, you know. And that would actually help settle uh, the things, settle things down. And he managed to stop that war in Sri Lanka at that time. And now, when you go to Nagadipa, it's a pilgrimage center, when you go there, it actually houses this throne. And it, they have the tree that the deva picked up in Sarvati and took down. The tree is also there. So you can go, you know, and you can uh, pay respects to the throne. You see, the throne becomes a kind of relic. It's a relic, not of the Buddha's body, but of what he has used. It's called Pariboga Dhatu. Okay, so it's a relic of something that he used. Another thing you can find is the bowl that the Buddha used, not at Nagadi, but elsewhere. But you can find the bowl. Because he used it, it's kind of sanctified, if you like. But one of the things was, he sat on this throne, and now you can go to Sri Lanka, and you can, uh, you know, you can pay your respects there. So it's a very nice thing. There's many um, uh, sites, pilgrimage sites, in Sri Lanka, 18, uh, sorry, 16 main uh, uh, pilgrimage sites in Sri Lanka around the country that you can go and see. Okay, so now I just summarize that so that you know about this thing. That was what happened tonight. We already told the story before, and it's only a short story anyway like this. But I want to tell you about another occasion you see tonight because it's not the only time that the Buddha brought peace where there was a war beginning. Yeah? And it's a very important thing that the Buddha did actually intervene in situations and brought people to peace. Yeah, brought warring sides to peace. So one occasion is this occasion where he went to Sri Lanka. Only a couple of months later, in the fifth, still in the fifth year, you see, uh, a couple of months later, then the Buddha brought peace to two other warring groups. Now, in northern India, I've described it before, they, you know, the states, if you were, were divided into republics and there was monarchies and so on. A couple of the republics were the Buddha's own people, the Sakyans, and, as it were, their neighbors and relatives who were the Kolians. So between the territory of the Sakyans and the Kolians, there was one river. The river is the Rohini River. And that river, they used to share the waters 
of that river yeah, for their irrigation. Of course, important to bring water uh, for your irrigation, then you can grow your rice and you can feed yourself and you can have surplus and you can expand your communities and so on and so forth. But you know, in India, during the month of June, that's at the end of the dry season. So all the water is running out. I've been in uh, Madhya Pradesh, which is, you know, not so far away. I was in Madhya Pradesh one time, and the water's actually in the river. There's a river going through the village. The waters had actually dried up by January, right? And they're still dry in June. There's no water, only underground catchment is left there. And many arguments taking place over that water and people fighting and things. I mean, in the village I was staying in, people were fighting over the water and everything, you know, because the water is so important. Another thing I remember from that time is it was, it's very, very flat in Madhya Pradesh. You can see to the horizon really a long way, and we could see clouds coming at the end of, the, end of June, and all the villagers would go rushing to the temple and they'd start banging the bells like they bang the bells here on a Thursday night. Banging the bells, trying to get the gods, you know, to hear them and know that they're there and bring the clouds to rain on them. And I, I remember seeing sometimes, you know, the clouds come and it doesn't rain. It goes over the top, you know, and they're banging furiously, trying to get the gods to let the water fall on them. Because it's so important, you know, if you've got no water, it's so important. You must have water for your crops, for your drinking, yeah, for your life, really, like that. So, in the uh, Sarkin country, Kolian country, it was also the end of the dry season, and the waters in the Rohini had fallen very, very low. And there wasn't enough water for both of them. Uh, so they started to fall into a dispute. Right? The Sarkians were saying, you should give us the water. If we have the water, at least we could water our crops. If we divide it, there's not enough water for anybody. But if, if we have the water, we can water our crops. So the Colians are saying, no, no, we should have the water. We can water our crops and you, you, know, you can do without like this. And you know, when people get angry, then they start insulting each other. So the Sarkians, you know, they've got an origin story. I told you before about the Singhalese origin story. They always have these kind of funny origin stories. So with the Sarkians, they believe that their brothers married their sisters, yeah, and from that union were born the Sarkians, okay? So all the Colians are blaming them for incest and saying, you know, they married their sisters, they married their brothers, like this. Now the Colians also, of course, have a funny story because the uh, progenitors of the Colians, one was... Uh, a, a princess who was a leper, and she was sent out from the um, from the community, and then she met another leper, and so from these two lepers, okay, that's where the Colians come from, you see, like this, and they lived in cola trees, so they were called Colians. So the Sarkians are blaming them, saying you know they're leprous and all this sort of thing like this. So, you see, anger leads to insults. And then, it started, they started hitting and fighting. They started, oh, you know, to get ready. And then they went back to their communities, called like a parliament, you know, to have a, a gathering and decide what they're going to do. And they decided to go to war. They're going to fight each other and whoever wins gets the water, you see. It's quite relevant for these days, you know, because very soon we're going to have water wars, yeah? 
Water is very, very short supply in many places. People actually don't have access to water in many places anymore. And, you know, uh, some of these multinational uh, companies, they go in and suck all the water out of the ground. And then when the farmers come, you know, they got deep wells, they still can't find water because it's been sucked out by Coca-Cola or something like that. You know, in other places, there's not, um, there's not enough water. The only clean water, drinkable water, is actually coming in bottles. Yeah, and people can't afford to buy the water and everything. So it's a very relevant story, I think. Anyway, they were fighting over this water. Again, Buddha was in Sarvati, and he was surveying the world to see what was happening in the morning, and then he found that the Sakyans were about to go to war with the Kolians. So, he knew how he could settle this war, and so he decided to uh, go for Pindapat in the morning in Sarvati, and after Pindapat, go to his hometown, Kapilavatu, or you know, actually to this border area between the uh, two tribes or the two clans, right? Again, he did the same thing or a very similar thing. He uh, went up into the sky and then through his supernatural power, he made everything dark. So it was dark all over the land and then, you know, everybody again calm down. And then an interesting thing happened. Because the Buddha was there, the Sakyans decided to throw away their weapons. They said they cannot kill people in front of the Buddha. Yeah, Having the Buddha just as an icon, if you like, in their midst was enough for them to throw away their weapons. And they said, even if the Kolians take the water, we cannot kill people in front of the Buddha. But the Kolians were also related to the Buddha and they also had the same idea. So they also put, a, put aside their weapons. And then the Buddha asked them why they had come to the two sides of the river. Why had they assembled there? So they had to say, you know, they were going to go to war with each other over the water, like that. And the Buddha asked a very relevant question, which was, you know, what is water worth? You know, so they said, it's actually, it's worth very little. You know, even if you've got water, it's actually worth very little. And what is blood worth? You see? So if you think about it, blood is worth more than water. Yeah? It's a very good teaching. If people would think about these sort of things, what is oil worth? Oil is worth so much, okay. But is it worth as much as blood? But still people go to war for oil, isn't it? And all the bloodshed that you see in the Middle East and all the people and families destroyed and everything like this, a lot of it is only you know, fighting about oil, like that. So we should keep these sorts of things in mind, you know. What are, you know, what are the true values? Blood is worth much more. It's worth more than water. It's worth more than oil. It's worth more than gold. Yeah, like this. So it was a good teaching uh, that he gave at that time. But he also uh, told Jataka stories. So I've told you before that, you know, many times the Buddha would tell Jataka stories to the people uh, to give them instruction. Because just as I hope, you know, the stories I tell you, you go away, you can remember these stories. Yeah. If you tell something in the abstract, much more difficult to remember. If you tell it in a story, you won't forget about water and blood real water and blood. But if I just tell you, you shouldn't be angry, it's not good, like that. You know, it's too abstract somehow. 
But if you've got a, an image, you can remember it. So the Buddha also used to teach through images. And it's a very important thing, you know. During the Middle Ages, the Jataka stories were really the main way of passing on the teachings uh, in the Buddhist community. And people would learn morality from those teachings. They were taught to children, you know, old people, all the old people in Sri Lanka when I was there, all of them know all these stories, but all the children know them as well. I was really, really astonished because I didn't know them. I knew abstract Buddhism and things like this, but I didn't know this story Buddhism like that. And even 11-year-old, 12-year-old boys and girls can tell you know, long stories uh, from the Jatakas. It's really a wonderful thing, you see. Now, less and less this sort of thing happens. And they would also, you know, play pantomimes of the Jataka stories. People would go round in like troops and then they would set up a stage and they would enact some of these Jataka stories and there's a way of telling them, you know, with, uh, you know, recitation and so on like this. Really wonderful if you ever hear it, but so rare to hear it these days. Everybody is watching television, really, going to the movies. They've got condition for something else, and they don't get these moral teachings anymore. Somebody turns up in the village and sets up a stage. Nobody goes anymore, so they don't go. But anyway... The Buddha told uh, some stories, so I also tell you the stories that he told on that time. Or I tell you a couple of the stories anyway, because he told uh, about five, so it's too much, you see. It will take too much time. But one of them is the Pandana Jataka. So this is an interesting story about a Pandana tree. I don't know what it is in English, I don't know if it's identified, but it's a Pandana tree and there was a bear, okay. So this bear used to go and rest in the shade of the pandana tree, right, during the midday. And then he would go every day and he would rest there like this. And then one day when he was resting, one of the branches from the tree fell down. It, I mean, it's just, you know, gone rotten, you know. One of the branches broke off fell down and it hit him like this and then he jumped up and he was a very angry bear, right? And he misinterpreted what had happened. He thought that the spirit living in the tree had thrown the branch at him, right? So he got angry with the tree and got angry with the tree spirit. It's also, if you think about it, how many times did we also, misinterpret what somebody said, what somebody did. We think they're like this tree spirit throwing branches at us, but in actual fact it's something completely different. Something that we don't understand, you know. But we, we see the branch falling, we know there's a spirit, tree spirit in the tree, yeah? And then we put two and two together and we get five. We think the tree spirit has been throwing branches at us. So the, uh, the bear got very, very angry. Now just at that time, there was a carpenter coming out from the local village. And the carpenter wanted to make a chariot. So he was looking for some good wood to make a chariot with. So he came up to this pandana tree and the bear was still there and then the bear said to him, what are you doing roaming about in the forest? And the carpenter explained, he wants to make, he's looking for good wood to make a chariot like this. And then the bear told him, you know, the best wood for making a chariot is pandana wood. And this here is a pandana tree. You cut down this tree, okay, and you can make the best chariot. 
yeah, out of it. And then the carpenter is very astonished. For one thing, he's never heard a bear talk before. <laughs> and he thinks, well, this is wonderful. The bear is telling me it must be true. If a bear is talking and he's telling me, then it must be true. I'll cut down the tree. And then the bear was very happy because he's got his vengeance on the tree spirit. So the bear, thinking his job is accomplished, he started to go off for forage for honey. Right? And then the tree spirit jumped out of the tree and took the form of a boy and he asked the carpenter, what are you, what are you doing? What do you want to do? And he said, I'm making a chariot. He said, do you know, bear skin is really good. <laughs> it's really good for chariots. You can lash you know, it together. It will last a really long time. And he said, but the bear is gone. He said, look, did you ever see a tree get up and walk away? A tree can't walk away, but the bear is walking away. You go and get the bear back. <laughs> so he went and brought the bear, okay, and then he killed the bear, skinned it, ate its meat, right, and then he's got the skin of the bear, and then he cut down the tree as well, right. So what happened, right, from misinterpretation, people get angry, yeah? Then they kill the bear and they cut down the tree. Everybody perishes. Yeah? Anger is a very wrong thing to do, you see. If you get angry, you don't make the right decisions. You try to hurt other people and they try to hurt you and everybody lands up being hurt. So the Buddha told this Jataka, you see, about the bear and the pandana. You won't forget that one either, you see. Okay, and then he told, actually, as I said, he told five jatikas, but that was one jataka about not getting angry, not misinterpreting, not jumping to conclusions, not attacking others, okay. Then the other jataka is called uh, the uh, Samodhamana jataka, and the moral of that one is that people who are relatives shouldn't quarrel but should work together. Okay, so I'll tell you what the story was. One time, the Bodhisattva was reborn as a quail. You know what a quail is? It's this very tiny bird. Yeah. So. The Buddha, I mean the Bodhisattva, was reborn as a quail and he was the head of a big group of quails. And there was a bird hunter in the district. And that bird hunter used to come out with his net and then he would throw the net and the quails get caught underneath. He scoop up the net, take them home and skin them and then eat some of them and the rest he could sell and make some money out of like that. So the hunter used to come, catch some of the Bodhisattva's group, take them away and next day come, next day, like that. So it was not a good situation. So the Bodhisattva came up with a good solution. He said when he throws the net all the quails must put their little heads through the net and all together they flap their wings and they take off, taking the net with them, yeah? And then they go to a thorn break and when they're over the thorn break they come down and then they can leave the net on the thorn break and they can pull their heads out and they can all go away. So the next day the, um, the hunter came, he threw his net, they all put their heads through and they flew off into the horizon like this, you see. Came to a thorn break, put it down like that and they all escaped, okay. 
and the next day same thing and the next day same thing but the hunter you know was also very clever and he thought he would just wait until a dispute arose amongst the quails because once a dispute has arisen he will be able to catch them again so there was another part of this group was a group of quails led by Devadatta isn't it okay so one time one of the quails when they were flying through the air when they came down by accident he came down on top of another quail and he put his head put his you know thing on it on the other quail's head he said get off my head landing on my head like that and then they started arguing yeah and he was saying i'm very sorry i didn't mean to land on your head and he said you're not being careful yeah you weren't being very careful and you can't just put your your foot on somebody's head like that and then again a quarrel started and so a dispute arose within the quails and there was these two groups one group following the bodhisattva and one group following devadatta and devadatta of course was stirring up more and more trouble okay and the hunter saw his chance because now the quails are in dispute they're not working together it's easy to catch them so he came along and again he threw his net yeah and the quails because they're not working together were not able to rise together didn't poke their heads through the net together didn't rise together didn't fly off together and the hunter was able to take them away and stew them yeah and sell the others so this was another uh, jataka that the buddha told that time to show how important the sakians and the kolians were actually related groups they should work together if they don't work together then disaster comes upon them yeah if they if they come you know a, a split in their loyalties it's very easy to overthrow them you can understand this also in malaysian politics i think you know what people want to do is divide communities and then they're very easy to control yeah it's actually not just malaysian politics of course it's politics all across the world that's what people do they divide people against each other and then they can uh control then they can control the populations so again harmony being together with your um you know with your relatives uh, settling disputes and so on will lead to success falling into dispute is going to lead it to a disaster so that was another one that he taught and the buddha also taught um a, a very famous sutta called the atadanda sutta it's now found in the sutta nipata and it really just tells the story about how the buddha saw the conflict in the world if you look on the news every night it's really repulsive you know you see so much conflict and uh, so much terrible things just now just before i came out tonight there's another of these um uh things come from uh the islamic state you know there's two two groups in libya one group they've taken to the ocean and they've beheaded them and the reason they've done it is because they're christian and another group is in the mountains and they shot them in the head and then they made a video out of it you see we see this sort of thing every night so the buddha also saw this conflict and was you know repulsed by the conflict and decided to you know uh to try to find the way out of samsara so this atadanda sutta is about the seeing of the conflicts and seeing of the uh situation in the world and the urge to 
uh, do something about removing yourself from samsara. Okay? Now then, the Sakyans didn't go to war, the Kolians didn't go to war, blood was not spilt like this. So the two groups together, they decided, you know, if they'd have gone to war, then they would have lost so many princes. And instead, they didn't go to war, they would give those princes for the Sangha. So, from each side, they elected 250 of the princes. That means the noblemen, if you like. And 250 Sarkians went forth at that time, and 250 Kolians went forth. Right? But, just like Nanda's story, if you remember Nanda's story, they were not very happy. Right. They hadn't actually chosen to go forth. Their elders had told them to go forth. And they were not they had had to walk out on their wives. Right. So they're all thinking about their wives and longing to go back to their homes like this. So the Buddha came to know about their dissatisfaction. And then again through his supernatural power he took those 500 and he went to the Himalayas, to what is um, Lake Anatota. And there he taught them the Kunala Jataka. I'm not going to tell you this Jataka because it's one of the most terrible Jatakas in the collection actually. It's about how, uh, how bad and uh, how terrible women are. But anyway, uh, in the context of the story, what he was trying to do was break, their attach break the monks' attachments to their previous wives. So he told them, it's a long jataka as well, really long story. You know, thousands and thousands of things that women do that are bad, like this. So, uh, he told about the frailties of women and then they all attained Sotapanna <laughs> on that teaching. And then he decided, not just Sotapanna actually, they also attained a binya. A binya are like the supernatural powers and things. And then he, uh, they decided to return uh, back to Kapilavatu. And although the Buddha by his supernatural power had taken them there, by their own supernatural power, they managed to return. So they came back to Kapilavatu by themselves. And he gave further instructions uh, to them and they attained Arahatship. So the 500 of them were all Arahats. Yeah. And that's when the Mahasamya Sutta, very famous Sutta that we chant during the Pirit chanting, Mahasamya Sutta, the great assembly, took place. And not only the 500 uh, Arahats gathered, but all the Devas from all the Lokas throughout the universe also came and gathered around Lord Buddha and the 500 Arahats in the Mahavana, in the great forest, on that night. And that's a very uh, famous gathering of the uh, of the sangha, right? And then the Buddha also taught six other suttas. Those suttas are found now in Sutta Nipata. It's about the six types of characters that there are in the world. Some people are lustful. Some people are hateful. Some people are deluded. Some people are thoughtful. Some people are faithful and some people are wise. So in the Buddhist teaching, in Visuddhi Magga also, you find these distinctions of the six types of character that you can find in the world. Lustful, hateful, deluded, thoughtful, faithful and wise. So when you go home tonight, 
you can have a little think about which one you are. Yeah. There are three, you know, three on one side and three on the other side. The lustful become thoughtful, the hateful become faithful, the deluded become wise. So you can have a little think about which one you are. Right? But another thing came out of the settling of this war, which was who is left behind? Yeah. Now the 500 princes have all attained arahatship, but the 500 wives are left in their house. Right, so they decided, seeing that their husbands had attained arahatship, they decided to go to Mahapajapati Gotami and see if together they could approach the Buddha and request the ordination for nuns. So the 500 women who went with Mahapajapati Gotami were these kind of like widowed women, not really widows because their husbands were still alive, but their husbands of course were arahats, so they were kind of out of the family. So it's those 500 women who accompanied Mahapajapati Gotami down to Vaisali where they asked for the Buddha to start the nuns order. And after agreeing to the Garudama, the eight Garudama, then the Buddha gave the going forth to Mahapajapati Gotami and then he asked the monks to give ordination to the 500 nuns. So those 500 nuns yeah, were the 500 wives of the 500 princes that had been given to the Buddha as a result of settling the war. So you see, it's also a moral story, you see. If you do something good, like bring people together, bring people into harmony, it doesn't just stop there. More good comes out of it. Yeah. Out of that came 500 Harahats, out of that came the Great Assembly, out of that came the ordination of women, yeah, so many things came out of it. So, now, what I wanted to tell these stories about, about the Nagas, you see, and about uh, this war that nearly broke out between the Sakyans and the Kolians, is because unlike, for instance, in the Abrahamic religions, where the gods are always ordering their followers to go out and kill the enemy. Yeah. Never once do you find anything of the sort in the Buddhist scriptures. It never ever happens. But what you do find is that the Buddha acts as a peacemaker. And just like people from other religions want to follow the example of their leaders, you know, and then they get into this idea of killing others, oppressing others, putting others down, making slaves out of them, and so on and so forth like this. Yeah, For us, the example is completely an op the opposite to that. The Buddha acted as a peacemaker. He went out of his way to bring people together. He also taught them how to overcome their defilements. If you overcome your defilements, you're no longer in conflict with yourself, you're no longer in conflict with others either. Yeah? Somebody who has completely overcome their defilements never gets into a conflict with anybody else because there's no need for it anymore. There's no point in it anymore. What they try to do is bring them to a higher level of spiritual development so they themselves will be able to overcome the conflicts that they are facing. 
like this. So I think this is um, a really important thing that we should know about this in our scriptures and in the stories that we tell amongst Buddhists, you know. We don't tell stories of wars, of conquest. We tell stories of reconciliation. We tell stories of harmony like this. So this is a very important thing. And if more people were able to bring those sort of qualities into the world today where there's so much conflict going on, yeah, then that would be, you know, for the betterment of everybody's, all the communities. We can bring everybody together if we talk about harmony. No more this dividing and fighting and everything like this, but bring harmony to the communities, uh, bring harmony to our own hearts, bring harmony to the communities, and then bring harmony to the world as well. So everybody say sadhu.